Hi, it's nice to see so many of you joining our Celtic virtual event. So let's start with our webinar for today. I will let you tell you tell you more about today's. Hi Brian. Hi everyone. This afternoon we will have our partners and friends from Tectonic showing all the advantage of the balanced low gradiator technology. A single full range BMR speaker delivers a smooth and extended power response into ultrasonic frequencies. You will learn how this unique BMR characteristics enable inner quality premium audio, high intelligibility and wide directivity that are found in the conferencing, personal audio, automobile and consumer products today. Now we will leave Paris to join Seattle where Tectonic is based. So take a nice cup of coffee, relax, not too much, and enjoy this webinar, but more of stay safe. So hi David, thanks for taking the time to share your knowledge. The platform is yours. Uh, welcome to the uh, Tectonic or uh, the Cell Tech webinar. Uh, my name is Paul Bickle. I'm an associate uh, mechanical engineer here at Tectonic Audio Labs in Seattle. I'm David Stokes. I head up the OEM business here at uh, Tectonic, and just thank want to thank you very much for joining our webinar this um, uh, today. Um, we got a couple things we want to talk to you about, and uh, you know, we'll hear the agenda. We're going to kind of we're going to go through a little overview of, of Tectonic, who we are, and um, where we're, how we're structured, and then we'll run into a, a technical discussion of the BMR, and then and then at the end talk about our value proposition, and then have a Q and A. Uh, one second, we're going to get this uh, going correctly. Yeah, that one. Perfect. Wonderful. We got it. Yeah, we got it. All right. Why don't you get the next? Um, so as we go through, uh, feel free to uh, type in and send us your questions. Uh, we'll get through them at the end of the presentation. Absolutely. I think we got this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're we're uh, located in our headquarters in Woodinville, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle. Um, there, we were founded as a company in 2011. Our primary focus then was quite a bit sound reinforcement. Uh, and then in uh, 2013, we acquired uh, the BMR patent portfolios from NXT. Some of you may know them, um, some of you may not, but we've uh, taken that technology and the good work they've done there and we've built upon that and have uh, grown, I would say, the, the value of the BMR and, and finding the right place for it in the markets. We are primarily, as you would note, uh, uh, you know, we sell uh, uh, drivers, BMR drivers like this, but we also do quite a bit of um, our own design and engineering work here and development. Our labs are quite, you know, as you can see there with, uh, with the design and analysis, we're pretty well filled out. And we, we like to you know, leave, leave this open as to our customers who have needs for designing, you know, subsystems and, uh, and other type of uh, 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 acoustic modules and whatever needs to be for our customers. When you look at it, we, we kind of focus on four major markets. Um, unified communications uh, with you know, definitely around conference speakers and uh, sound bars and other, other uh, communication devices for that. Uh, VR, VR headsets. Like that. This is the track that's that's right. That's set. Automobiles. And then we also have the consumer speakers here, like this. So those are our four main markets. A lot of where we've been uh, putting a lot of focus in lately is in unified communications and personal audio and headsets, automobiles, and uh, consumers. So we've kind of very much across the board. We have uh, uh, we have quite a compelling value propositions with the BMR product. I mean, so I had to take in a real quick, uh, give you a, a, a little bit of a study on, on, the, on the VMR and something we did with Valve. And this is going to show a little bit of what the VMR's value proposition is. 
The BMR provides a very wide directivity, very smooth power response, and um, is able to uh, get uh, uh, high frequencies, you know, up to 180 degrees. And this now enables, uh, has benefits into all markets, but I wanna illustrate it here with a project we did with for Valve, which is you know, the Valve Index, which is an off-ear headset. This is really unique because most, you know, most headsets are on your ear or in your ear. But Valve wanted to create a new experience. They wanted to create a headset that was, you know, the gold standard, if you will. And they wanted to have a improve their audio experience. So they came to us and they said, you know, we'd like to. We have three of these these problems here. You know, we want to have a convincing, immersive audio experience. We want to reduce the heat off the head, and we want to eliminate ear fatigue because many of these gamers would be you know, have these songs could be for four hours. So we, we took a look at it and we went through with some designs and we designed a, a BMR that we felt would fit, fit the need. What's unique about this is the BMR is pretty much the only drive on the planet that the, the valve engineers can find that had the directivity, the wide dispersion of in full frequency to give the experience they desired. All the other transducers, you know, all very good ones too, you any kind of movement this way or that way, they would lose the experience. Whereas with the BMR, it's, it remained very, you know, very wide. This illustrates something that would be a very difficult, very difficult test case, but it applies throughout all the products that um, we go into. This wide directivity, high intelligibility, and that maintains this way in a single transducers and in mid in high HF. So that. You know, in the if you could look at this and say this is this is probably the most challenging. You could you can see as we move up into other other embodiments, you know that this the same principle, you know, applies. The foundation, you know, when the foundation of the BMR BMR technology is unique to us. Only the BMR can provide a smooth and extended power response into the whole frequencies in a single transducer, a single full range transducer. By achieving and being able to do and have this characteristics, that is what enables the, the wide directivity, the high intelligibility off access, ultrasonic output, and, and and so much more as when we get in, you will show you that these impact not just the audio, but system design and cost. But first, I want to we're going to kind of delve in and we'll deal with that a little bit at the end. We'll talk about the value proposition and we'll uh, talk and where we are in roadmap and how we move things. And then we can discuss it afterwards. I want to delve in a little bit more. And by me, I mean, Paul, we'll go into some of the, the deeper dive into the BMR technology and, and um, give you a basis of understanding there to see that we're uh, that we really have something special here. Uh, so as you said, we're going to take a look at BMR technology. Uh, but to do so first, uh, we kind of develop need to develop uh, and set the set the scene for why BMR is important. Uh, and to do so, we'll look at the limitations that uh, typical uh, pistonic drive units have. Um, and then uh, we'll go through the theoretical concept for what an ideal radiator would be, which is foundational to the idea of BMR. Um, however, it's, since it's a theoretical concept, uh, we have to make some changes to it um, so we can uh, make this ideal concept into a realized device in the real world. Uh, then we'll kind of look at the operation of a BMR, uh, and then we'll show you data of BMRs that we've designed and that we've tested, we've measured uh, to substantiate uh, these claims that we've kind of set forth here. Uh, so first, we're looking at the limitations of pistonic drive units. Um, and so the first one that we can we look at is cone breakup. So when the mechanical uh, bending waves are uh, of similar dimension to the diaphragm, uh, the cone will start to bend and buckle. And so this causes unfavorable um, uh, artifacts in the frequency response. So you can see the graph on the right on the top, uh, those severe peaks and dips at the higher frequencies, uh, those are created by the, uh, the unnatural uh, and the non-rigid movement of the cone. 
Uh, so what a designer would do is they would take, uh, they would cross over from one drive unit to another drive unit uh, just using that usable uh, frequency of each unit, i.e. crossing from like a bass to a mid-range to a tweeter uh, to avoid these unnatural characteristics because it gives an unnatural tonality uh, to the sound. Now the uh, other limitation is what we call power beaming. So when the uh, wavelengths in air are similar to or less than the dimension of the circumference of the diaphragm, uh, then the radiation pattern of the uh, speaker begins to narrow as frequency increases. So on the little plot uh, underneath the frequency response, you can see as frequency increases, the radiation pattern goes from uh, very uniform and homogeneous to uh, a more narrowed beam. So the level is still the same on axis, but as you move off axis 15 degrees, 20, 35, 40, um, the level drops off significantly. Um, and again, a designer would use multiple drive units so they could try to maintain, so you'd have a two or three way system to try to maintain that, that directivity uh, over the full frequency range. Um, so that kind of sets the scene for why, why BMR is important. Um, and so the fundamental uh, piece upon which BMR is built uh, is the, I, the example of an ideal acoustic radiator. Uh, and this is, a, is an example that's uh, widely studied and accepted uh, in the acoustic industry. Um, and so we start with a flat circular disc uh, that's driven by a perfect force. And uh, a perfect force is defined to be as one that has no mass and no damping. Uh, and what's special about this example uh, is that it features a flat on axis uh, sound pressure level uh, as well as a smooth and extended uh, sound power response. So you can see on the right, there is an image of uh, the top view of this flat circular disc as well as an axisymmetric view of the panel. Um, and so the call out, oh, sorry. Um, the uh, dark blue region where uh, we call out as the, the nodal line is uh, the line about which uh, as, uh, the, as the panel is excited, uh, it will bend and flex uh, around this point and it'll rotate here instead of translate. Uh, and so any, any, or this panel has several like natural occurring modes over the frequency band. And so what gives us this flat on axis sound pressure level is when you compare the area, the area of, uh, that is inside this first nodal line um, to the area outside of the first nodal line, uh, those areas are equal. And the pressure contributions um, from these areas are equal and opposite and cancel out on axis. Um, so that gives us a, a uniform, uh, radiation or dispersion of energy in front of the drive unit. Uh, however, as the listener starts to move off axis of this uh, circular disc, then that's where the, the modal contributions uh, start to uh, sum with the piston component. So the uh, as the modes take over, uh, or as uh, the modes of the panel are, uh, are excited, uh, you get additional energy off axis and it kind of fills in the the uh, cold spots that you would have experienced with a typical uh, pistonic drive unit. So we acknowledge that this is an ideal concept and one that you cannot realize in real life because it is a perfect force and um, it's hard to find a force with no mass and no damping. Uh, so what do we do? We take this flat circular panel and we drive it with a voice coil. Um, however, the addition of this uh, mass to the panel uh, breaks the natural free behavior of the disc. Uh, so you can see the graph on the right, uh, the free disc response in pink uh, is fat, flat, and we would like that. However, by adding the voice coil, we get that orange uh, response. Uh, so that has unfavorable peaks and dips. Uh, so fortunately, although we add a voice coil to drive the panel, uh, there is a way to rebalance uh, the disc to regain that flat on axis um, sound pressure level as well as the um, sound power response uh, that we were talking about. So uh, to rebalance the disc, we perform what is called a mode fix. Uh, so we analyze the, the panel based on its mechanical uh, and dimensional properties, and we can determine uh, the, uh, the number of modes uh, that are in the 
operating band that we are looking to design the drive unit for. Uh, and based on those number of modes, we determine the number of locations that we have to add masses on to the disc to rebalance the nodal lines so that the areas um, of the panel moving forward or backward are again equalized and so we can get that flat on axis uh, or so we can get the pressure contributions on axis to cancel out uh, while still having the off axis uh, modal contributions. Uh, and so this isn't something that we necessarily guess and check on. Uh, we actually are able to mathematically determine the locations of these added masses uh, using the admittance function of the disk. Um, so on the left, you can see that's a plot. Uh, the minima on the graph show where uh, the locations at which the panel resists translation uh, and favor rotation. So that would be a location where we would put uh, a ring mass. Um, and then on the right, you can see a cross-section view of a BMR panel uh, that has the voice coil, some ring masses, and again, the roll surround. Um, so that's just that's how like the BMR is composed. Uh, so in practice, uh, here are a couple animations of the actual um, uh, operation of a BMR. So on the left, you can see the panel is moving in rigid motion. So that is the piston component. So low frequencies, the diaphragm will not uh, flex or bend. Um, so however, as you move higher in frequency, the panel will then begin to uh, the modes will start to or will be introduced and so at any or as frequency increases your output is not only just the piston component but also this modal component um, and you can see that here uh, in this next animation where this we're looking at the directivity of a BMR speaker in the full frontal hemisphere um, of the BMR and we're looking at 15 kilohertz. So typically in a cone speaker, you would have seen a very a tight or a narrow beam of energy just coming right off uh, on axis, or sorry, directly on axis to the driver. However, uh, because this is a BMR and it has uh, summed outputs of the piston and the modal component, we get very like wide dispersion uh, across the front hemisphere. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's uniform and it's very immersive. Uh, again, here are some directivity plots just to compare the dispersion from a BMR and a piston. And so for a piston drive unit on the bottom, you can see that at low frequencies, it's very, uh, it's a uniform radiation pattern. However, as frequency increases, you get the, the similar uh, sensitivity on axis. However, the level drops off significantly as you move uh, off axis. Uh, conversely, with a BMR, uh, you can see that, again, at low frequencies, you have that uniform uh, radiation pattern. However, as you begin to move higher in frequencies, you see the contributions of the modes of the speaker, uh, and that fills in the cold zones, the cold listening zones that you would have uh, experienced with a piston driver. Yeah, I would, uh, very good. I think some of you are thinking, well, if you're adding a mass, surely you're kind of hurting sensitivity, that's, right? That's what they say, yes. Um, First question. Yeah. <laughs> so. And so uh, while you do you do add mass and you lose sensitivity, it's only maybe half a dB to a dB of sensitivity. Um, but the energy doesn't just go away. Uh, it's actually the that loss of energy goes into the off-axis output of your driver. So what you sacrifice in a little bit of uh, of level, you get in uh, directivity output uh, in front of the speaker. Yeah, I mean, if you look at today's modern uh, devices, you know, from smart speakers, uh, conference, you know, conference, um, uh, tabletop com conference uh, speakers, sound bars for conferencing or at home, you know, you you know, having the ability to have uh, of this very wide directivity information is much more um, in line with how we listen to music today as to how we used to listen to it tomorrow. Correct. Before. Yeah. 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 Uh, so now that we've kind of presented, this is this is BMR. This is how it works. Uh, let's look at some of the BMRs that we've actually designed. Uh, so this is a contour plot on the right. Um, and a the frequency response on the left uh, of a 2.5 inch BMR. 
On the left, you can see the flat on axis uh, sound pressure level in red. Um, and notice that this graph is up to 40K uh, instead of uh, just 20 kilohertz. So we get uh, consistent off axis or consistent ultrasonic output from our drive units. Um, and you can also see the smooth and extended power response uh, of this drive unit as well. And so that, that off-axis energy is more visualized here in the contour plot on the right, uh, where you can see at lower frequencies, it's very uniform. But as you move into the upper frequencies, you can see a little bit of a combing effect start to begin. And that is the, the modal output uh, that is filling in those, those cold zones that you typically would have seen with a regular speaker. Uh, we have another one. Uh, this is a 3.5 inch BMR. Uh, again, consistent ultrasonic output uh, up to 40K. And we have that flat on axis SPL as well as the smooth and extended power response. Um, and then here in the contour plot, you can see the modal contributions a little more starkly um, here in the, the combing effect. But this is this is really the core of, of BMR and how uh, and the value that it brings to the uh, companies that we've been and the products that we've been uh, working with. Uh, so really quick, we want to just show you guys something that we have uh, we just released uh, last week. So this is the BMR 54C. Uh, this is a three inch BMR. Um, and on the left, you can see the power response. Uh, this was taken in-house uh, in our anechoic chamber. Um, and you can see the smooth and extended power response well beyond uh, the pistonic range uh, here, uh, all the way up to 40K. Um, but then also we get that, we get the wide directivity. So at low frequencies, it's fairly uniform. However, when you look at uh, 33K kilohertz uh, in ultrasonic frequency, we get very good output, even you know, 60 degrees off axis. Um, so that's kind of that, that's the technology we have, um, and kind of the offering that we we provide. Uh, so David will go a little bit uh, more into that. And the benefits of BMR is, you know, all of them inherently, you know, have not only the wide directivity, but it does extend, you know, into the ultra ultrasonic some more than others. You know, but it is there. Uh, if you look at for some of the from some of you that know us, you might look at our data sheets and say, "Hey, wait a minute, it's 20 kilohertz." Well, we we um I think really up to now the market hadn't really demanded that, and then we've been seeing more demand for ultrasonics as as uh, as the as over the last year. But if you look at our, our roadmap, you know, you know, as we move along, we have basically have three families. Um, we have, of course, the traditional round. Of, you know, from smaller to the larger, you know, all come with a battery apparently. <laughs> and then um, and then a, a square, which tends to, you know, which we are finding more interest in, in, in for sound bars and other designs that, you know, for ID. And then we're introducing our new line of HARP, which is high aspect ratio panel, a nice Ackerman. And you can see that here. The one that you're looking at there on the screen is uh, 15.5 millimeters wide. It's a mid HF and about 100 millimeters long, you know, 30 odd so millimeters deep. Uh, the benefit of this, and we're really excited about this family as, as it comes out here in 2021 because of the form factor for slimmer designs, um, you know, being able to put in eight pillars of cars. Uh, we're gonna we are gonna have an all of our lot of all of our products. You'll see we'll have full range in mid HF, um, where the first harp out is a smaller mid HF. We're gonna grow that family, at, you know, over the next over over time here. The the one thing to note about and this is the beauty of the BMR technology is yeah you would look at this and say hey i can get a lot of wide dir directivity this way but what about along the long axis well yeah you do you get this you you get the bmr uh, uh, provides not only the, the, in the in the in the uh, the width but the length that wide directivity so you're getting a full a full 180 degrees of of, of audio coverage which is great for you know any for where for if you're in a conference room. Fundamentally, when you're in a conference room, you have this wide directivity, or if you're at home listening to TV, 
you know you're going to hear no matter where you are you're going to hear every word the intelligibility is going to be there mechanically all the time so next we'll be we're pretty proud as we'll be keep an eye on us coming towards the end of next year we'll have some new uh, the next generation of our technology will be coming out with lower cost equivalent performance and something to watch we're very excited about that and i think it's going to be uh, again even expand uh, the bmr into um, many many more products across right. the markets this this slide is how we see kind of how we see how we create value within the, the ecosystem you know with 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 our uh, with the oems the odms and ultimately the end user and again i'm going to push this because this is very important the the key the foundation you know call it the spine of the bmr is a smooth and extended power response that we know and have seen goes into the ultrasonic, but it can be done in a single driver. You don't need a tweeter, you don't need to. You can achieve these in a full range, a mid, mid HF, and this adds quite a bit of value. It, the, the big value it gives is that clear natural audio, right? There's no crossovers, There's you're, it's, it's very natural in, it, in, it, in its response as you, move up as you remember you're not seeing you're not seeing um your power being uncontrolled it's controlled this also allows the wide directivity like that sorry just like that that you know along the long axis it also provides the ultrasonic output that's controlled and you can as paul showed it was out to uh, 60 kilohertz well what does that really mean well as you follow you know, as you follow the path down to ultimately delivering a product or delivering an intent in a product to your customer and all based on your design and your requirements, we believe the BMR gives you a, quite a bit of options on how to deliver that intent and what it may be. When you look at the audio system, and I'll just take this for example, because as you know, it's not one-to-one -one. when you're designing a system, it's all about trade-offs. But let's just take one as an example. Say you have a two-way system, and you and you and you uh, decide to say I'm going to use a this BMR. What it enables you to do is to remove a tweeter, because now you have a full range of full range device, and you remove the tweeter. Well, that has quite a bit quite a bit of impact. Remember when you've got you've you've removed a crossover, you've um, you've been able to. Uh, uh, extend if you look into the uh, system side we'll just shorten this up because you can see the other points now you just recovered some space that was allocated to that tw uh, to that tweeter maybe you decide you want to ha uh, uh, have a different id maybe you maybe you you're now allowed to remove some components you don't need as much passive so maybe a, a, a smaller amp um, you have to, it still gives you the ultrasonic feed features. Maybe it's heat management that is something you need to manage. That extra space helps that. What it does do is also lowers your supply chain costs. You have less components, you're sourcing less, you're managing less, um, reduce the IQC time, and you reduce your co you know, cost of complexity. complexity. So when you look at it, you're saying, well, okay, it's a, it's a transducer, but not really. When you look at the total cost of ownership that this one very simple smooth and extended power response starts to cascade down to the customer it, it, it could be quite amazing because when now you have all these different you know options to use ultimately to say here customer here's what i'm going to offer you and in this case you know you you know you're going to get a premium experience you're going to have that vocal intelligibility or just intelligibility everywhere in you can lower your system cost. You're improving quality. You're removing components. You're removing things. Remove removes the chance of risk. In a, in an instance, if we took like unified communications, the you know, and you're employing it across multiple products, just taking a look at a ceiling speaker with that directivity, you may be able to remove the amount of speakers you need in half. Well, that now is reducing you know the cost of installment and the total cost of ownership over time. So everybody's everybody's um, intent is different, but as you start as you start looking into what your customer needs, what market you're in and what your customer needs, 
Do you need vo high vocal intelligibility? Do you need ultrasonics? Do you need these things? The BMR should, it should, be, is, should be considered um, and looked at in a much broad, in a broader sense. Um, I, we could go in and talk about this all day long. I'd love to hear if you have any questions specific as we go into Q&A. But um, I'd like to you know, challenge me on this. This is our view. Love to hear your thoughts. Um, but that's uh, really what we have yeah. to talk to you about. I'd like to leave you with that and enter into a Q&A time. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, quite pipeline of questions up here. Yay. Um, so we'll Maybe start we with... Is it possible to put that up on that one? Uh, once. Okay, we'll see you put on the bigger screen. So first question is, what would the response look like in the other hemisphere? Uh, Hi, Brian. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so anyways. Um, right, my yeah, so the, the response would, I imagine, be the same, or would be the inverse of what's happening. Well, well this might be, is this a question directly re related to the open back headset? Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I'm not quite sure if that's the case. Brian, can you clarify this? Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm answering your question. Oh, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, but the so BMR uh, essentially acts as a as a dipole in open air. So whatever the the output on the front is the inverse of what happens uh, behind the uh, behind the speaker. So however, when we design it, we typically put it into a closed system. So we seclude whatever is happening on the back half of the drive unit from the front half of the drive unit. Yeah. Um, and, and so for the, the implementation here on the headset, um, because it's a, it's a near field application, we actually leverage this, um, this feature so that whatever you hear, whatever you hear in the near field uh, is also or cancels out in the far field on the back side of the headset. So in this case, we get minimal uh, sound leakage uh, to the ambient around the listener. Uh, hopefully that. Yes, for the open back headset, what would the response look like for the person sitting next to the device? Yes. Uh, so it'd be. The, the person next to yeah. whoever is listening would not really be hearing uh, anything. Yes, that's really interesting, Brian. That's, that's a great question because a lot of it, sometimes, you know, if you're in a dead silent room, you know, you would hear some, but very little next to somebody. You would see some very high frequencies because we get so much cancellation in the far field, but we keep the integrity and, the uh, and you know, the what you say, fidelity in the, in the near field. Uh, if your room ambient noise comes up, you, it's basically um, you don't you don't hear it. Matter of fact, here in our labs, when we're practicing, you'd have to get pretty close to hear someone when someone's playing a game. Crank up pretty loud Correct. to hear something. Yeah, I'm gonna pull this out real quick. This is really interesting uh, because this question has come up because we're getting a lot more interested in the off-ear headset for um, maybe at home. You know, for people that are taking call centers at home or using it, you know, for other, you know, watching TV or many other things. And in that case, um, you, you, you're you able to hear, with the benefit of that is you're able to hear everything going on around you. And like the valve head say, you kind of keep the heat off the head. You're not having the ear fatigue. And you're able to hear what's going on in the house. Did Uber Eats show up? You know, is your dog bark, is something going on? Yet, the people in the room are, are especially in another room, is going to hear nothing, right? You'd have to be like Paul and I close, wouldn't you say? Correct, yeah. Before you're going to hear something. Uh, again, it's level dependent. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope, I hope that answered your question, Brian. Yeah. Um, so the next question we have is, uh, how can you use the ultrasonic bandwidth available from the BMR? Um, so this is a great question. Uh, we just kind of started diving into this uh, a few months ago, uh, mm -hmm. actually, when we saw kind of this need for ultrasonic output uh, to come up in the verticals, the market verticals that we've been uh, looking mm -hmm. at. And so uh, I think one of the, the big things is being able to pair uh, vision uh, with, uh, like camera vision with uh, vision of the actual uh, device. Uh, so we can use the ultrasonic output of a speaker to kind of start to beam form and see the individuals around the table. Um, however, up until or without ultrasonic output, 
uh, you can, you're limited to the resolution of beam that you can create. So for example, if you had a beam or if you're using maybe say eight kilohertz as a frequency, uh, you can only get a resolution of maybe five or six people around the table. Mm -hmm. However, as you increase that frequency, you can start to uh, decrease or you can increase your resolution. So mm -hmm. now you can see maybe 10 to 12 people around the table. Yeah. Quite a bit too around with for hand gesture, you know, gesture control, also ping in the room, see what the, what, what's around. A lot of times in conferencing, and this is some of the applications we're seeing, is comparing the camera with ultrasonics allows you to get distance and a much better idea of who's in the room, where they're sitting. Yep. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Uh, the next question is, what are the thinnest drivers you offer? Uh, offer? Say something in the one to two inch diameter. Um, so is this a, if this is a question about depth, I think we're all, um, so this is probably about a 1.75 inch uh, diaphragm, the square BMR, uh, and it's probably about an inch and a half deep. Um, and then like the valve index driver is about an inch deep, uh, but also about a one and a half inch uh, diaphragm. Application sometimes when there is there we look at exciters and other ways to transduce mm -hmm. you know to 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 solve those problems. But right now the BMRs are you know in, not in the one to two millimeters. Since we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about IMD? I is this uh, intermodulation distortion? Um, using the Daniel, same. Uh, you're using the same driver diaphragm to produce one hertz. Yes, so that's a really good question. Uh, have you? I haven't looked much into the IMD or yeah. the intermodulation distortion, yeah. but we can definitely get back to we you have on some that. Yeah, we have some um, studies on that, and we um, one of the biggest issues we were worried about it was how it relates to smart speakers and microphones. Mm -hmm. The studies that we've had have actually shown that uh, there's been little to no, um, well, uh, little to no uh, impact. As a matter of fact, we've seen some qualitative, qualitative, not quantitative um, uh, experiences that we've actually been able to increase some of the bar gins around that. So I think we that that we have some uh, so a little probably follow up maybe with um, Celtech, and we will swing back to you and get you a little more deeper study on that. Yep. Okay. Can you speak to the honeycomb design of the diaphragm itself? Oh, yes, definitely. It's a, um, do we have any here? Um, I don't know, I wish, I wish we should have brought that as a prop. Okay, so it's, yeah, bas it's basically a, yeah, it's, it's a common material and pretty much, uh, let me say this, uh, all of our drives can be manufactured on existing transducers lines. In the same glues, same materials, same motors, same, same supply chain, right? That. So there you look at it for a bigger one. You can see the, yeah. the honeycomb. Um, yeah, we've, we've found that the honeycomb in this particular design gives a very nice tonal, to, tonality. Yeah. Well, that was easy for me to say. <laughs> and so we, but we're always looking at new materials too. So um, uh, it, the ones that you're looking here is a doped paper yeah. on, on a honeycomb yeah. design. The, the honeycomb structure uh, gives us is able to give us the rigidity that we need while also being able to keep the, the diaphragm as light as possible um, so we're not uh, detracting from the, the sensitivity that we can have for a driver. Um, but we do we have been doing a lot of studies on our materials and we're always looking for new ones uh, so we can improve our sensitivity uh, mm -hmm. as well as like the mechanical um, the mechanical properties of the diaphragms that we use. Yeah. Um, next question, what is the SPL at the mouth if wearing the valve headset? Um, example, if it was measured with a hat. Ooh, we, uh, we might have that data, but it's, we're gonna have to dig that one out. That one, it's been a while. Um, yeah, so, we had a hat slip through our hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think we can, that's one I think we can, we can, we can dig that one, dig that uh, up for you. Yeah. There is a, you know, that's something we do, we know uh, ourselves, have done some study on, but we don't have that at our tip of our mm -hmm. hands right now. Uh, can you measure uh, or can you speak more about the off-year concept, advantages, constraints, uh, possible improvements in the future? Oh, yes. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. A lot. Yeah, let's talk about it. So 
the advantages. The advantage, the key advantages uh, around the VR is part a lot around the uh, spatialization. Uh, uh, the primary, the primary goal for Valve was just to give the very best VR uh, realistic um, um, uh, uh, what would you call it um, experience possible. It also reduced head heat, and it also, of course, you know, the ear fatigue. Uh, we're seeing, which is interesting, because when we went into this and when Valve approached us with the concept. Um, you know, we were like, wow, that's pretty interesting. They went, they pretty much went through every driver on the planet and it eventually came, you know, came across the VMR, I believe at Parts Express mm -hmm. and came to us and they happened to be down the road, which is nice. And they were, um, they said, hey, you know, we think this works. We really want to be able to, you know, to get this experience. And also, you know, the, as you get off the ear, now you're hearing more naturally like you would, you know, in an environment and your facial features and how your ears, your ears are shaped. So it actually started creating a much better, a oh, much better or better, um, you know, uh, spatialization, yeah, the better spatialization, overall ex experience. The, the awareness um, yeah. and like the, e the ease of listening and how natural sounding yeah. it is. Yeah, so as, you know, so as, you know, and I'm happy to dig in deeper with this, you know, off, you know, you know to the offline, but as we, you know, as we're starting to see, there is, you know, um, applications coming up with people maybe saying, hey, can we put this in a helmet, maybe like in a, you know, a hot, a, you know, in a, in a warehouse that's noisy, but you need to know you're not going to get ran over by a forklift. But one of the growing interests has also been at home, you know, where people are in their home offices now because of COVID and they're spending all day is to be able to be not, not only hear their environments, but not have the fatigue and you know, in that on their you know on their head is very natural the sound. And you and like I said, is Uber Eats there? Is, you know, are my kids okay? So you know, so that and so this is kind of interesting because this is a, in a case where we we design something and now there's more and more applications that are coming in that you know we hadn't even really thought of to be quite frankly. Um, yes, we are. We have another drive that we're starting um, because of the home and because of the you know. You know some of the some of the uh, what would you say the applications this 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 was designed literally to melt your brains and uh, you would never want to go full 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 blow um, valve just said give us you know let's let's just really go we're gamers you know so now we're doing a we're doing a, a version that will be rough, roughly cut the weight in half and we're going to do a little lighter weight drivers simply for these other markets that I'm, i was talking about yeah. uh not, not a whole lot of constraints that go into uh, designing with an open ear driver. Um, mm -hmm. Most likely, I would say constraints are closer around like the the idea of kind of how how you hang it uh, from the head. Mm -hmm. But as far as placement, uh, because we have that wide directivity, uh, it's, it's it's very forgiving on where where you can place it, uh, and it's very optimal for everyone with different head shapes and circumferences uh, and things like that. Yeah, and and for the constraints, you know, I you know I I would I would probably say if you're you know working you know at an airport and you're out in the tarmac, you probably don't want them. Probably <laughs> your your sound for a little behind. But I, you know, I think that comes down to you know with what your market you're what you're looking at specifically to see whether this would be a a, a good solution. Um, yeah. uh, so got another question. Um, it's about uh, ultrasonics uh, and using data over or transferring yes. data over sound. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, that's uh, actually one of the use cases that I know people are using a machine to machine communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, there's. Yeah. So we're, I would I would say we're open to yeah. discussing that. Um, okay. Just I would say connect with us offline. Uh, we can set up a meeting and discuss that. Let's see what you're interested um, in. I've seen a lot of. Uh, unified communication products kind of on the market now uh, that'll kind of like if you have a giant present presentation screen uh, it'll ping the laptops or the devices of the people in the room uh, and it'll sync everyone up uh, onto the like the correct presentation and mm -hmm. screen sharing and things like that. Yep. Cool. And that's... Uh, Do we have any uh, open any voice questions? Or... Uh, yeah, uh, so there are some 
if anyone has any more questions, uh, feel free to send those in. Um, I think is uh, one of the questions that we actually kind of get frequently is uh, designing a BMR. How did like does did the design designing a BMR into a system change uh, because it's yeah, different from a pistonic drive unit? Uh, and the answer is no. You kind of you design it into the uh, into the system the same way you would a typical drive unit. Uh, it's the panels just different, and you get different dispersion characteristics. But as far as designing like your acoustic enclosure behind it, uh, designing it with passive radiators or a port, um, tuning your box, it's all the same. It's yeah. all the same. Uh, you just get these additional benefits on top of um, because you're using a BMR. Yeah. So what do you want to open up? Uh, yeah, and I believe uh, if yeah, our lines are open, because you know, if you want to unmute your uh, you're free to your you. microphone, uh, we'll take tonic customers. Oh, well, we assist customers through the design process. Absolutely, um, we're a big part of our uh, offering uh, to our customers is design services. Uh, you know, for instance, we a product here we did with uh, which is an Alexa enabled um, smoke detector. I put it there because it looks like, you know, I forgot to talk about it. But we did uh, pretty much all the uh, acoustic design. Um, with Valve, we work around the acoustic design, electronic design too. So we have a, a very robust team of not only, a, a, you know, a, what would you say, transducer engineers, but system engineers as well that scale everything from a small, which is a Bluetooth speaker, all the way to sound reinforcement systems that will, you know, light up a stadium. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. Uh, are there any more questions? Well, I think that's it. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Uwe. Um, thanks for your nice presentation, first of all. Um, well, thank you very I, much. I have a question. Have you um, ever? explored uh, the the off-ear uh, valve concept uh, not only for the VR application but for musicians um, oh boy yeah and, and we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, people playing their instrument uh, maybe even in, in a orchestra uh, and uh, how that works how that feels if is there some experience on that this this is a really good question because Basically, the foundation of this company is pro audio. My background is M audio. I have my own audio wireless company, and uh, we are, have quite a few ex Mackey people here. <laughs> uh, you know, so you know when when you start bringing this up, we get defocused from things that make money, and then we look at you know you know the old adage how do you make how do you make a small uh, a fortune in the music industry? You know, start with a large one. But it's our passion, and the the short answer to your question is yes, it can be. Um, I would have to get with Marcelo, uh, you know, because I would say, um, you know, we're, you know, we are designing a standalone headsets like you see here. This is basically our first prototype that we're just wrapped yeah. up mm -hmm. literally today. Yeah. It's fundamentally has the same performance. I didn't use my props very well today. I think, you know, too early in the morning and the caffeine is just kicking in. So, you know, as you see, you know, here, we're gonna, hold on to yeah, well, why don't you put that on? Show them. Oh, here, yeah. you might, here are my... Uh, You'll be my boss. So if you look at this, you see a little bit off here. This is sitting more off here than we'd like right now. Mm -hmm. But you know, bring it in a little bit. But the answer to your question in short is yes. It it should be just fine. Where we where we started getting a little bit worried because we'd started looking into could we use these for mixing, you know, as like a true near uh, near field monitor. Um, we're mm -hmm. still just we're still looking at that, and we I think we need to add a little more oomph around. You know, in some in, in some areas, but I think for mon being a monitor, you know, within the orchestral world, I think it, I think they might do just fine um, because you're you're you know within that environment. The nice mm -hmm. thing about it is you you know is is the nice thing about something like that is you're still going to be hearing your ambient around very well, but the person next to you, believe it or not, doesn't hear the sound. It, it's very quiet. Um, you know, I'd probably. We should probably post the link over to Val's to Emily Ridgeway. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're so if you're sitting next to somebody like if I sit next mm -hmm. to Paul here and we're in some a, a noise levels at a certain level, you're really not hearing. Yeah, no. The, uh, yeah. Since it's such a close application um, and it's an it's an open back mm -hmm. uh, 
design so whatever is produced on the uh, on the front side of the diaphragm the opposite is happening on the back side so uh, it cancels out in the far field yeah uh, so the the leakage of the sound is minimal uh, to the people around you yeah we'll, we'll, we'll put a little package together with some links okay yeah, yeah sure. afterward hopefully follow up so you can see this one of the interesting things I find, though, you know, when you're, you know, you're with the technology that we didn't see, we knew for VR, AR, mixed reality, we had something special. And we were, and, and what you were talking about, you know, I was thinking, I, I one of my previous companies was doing wireless, um, you know, wireless for guitar and really get a monitor. Is, is the, um, is that it also has become very interesting for within for the office at home now. Now is where yes, we're making exactly. This. That's, yeah, that's yeah. one of the things. Many people stay at home and and uh, yeah. they just just train and and practice their instruments, and then you just yeah. just listen to the sound of the the music, and it's you you fine. join in. Uh, Why yeah. you don't have the heat building up? You don't have the occlusion effect. You don't don't have Not anything right. in the canal. It just just feels fine. There's no fatigue, and and I think that's just a perfect perfect thing uh, to help uh, playing your instrument yeah, yeah. at home uh, for everybody joining the orchestra uh, and, and, and be yeah. there right in the middle without disturbing anybody uh, okay if you, if you sing loud of course your neighbors will hear that but but they never hear what you you listen to uh, from from your headset and no, that's actually a point. What you just said, Uber, was something that you know gets my blood going to make a product. Because ultimately, my background is putting products out there. <laughs> you know, yeah. was, was, I wanted to do a little mixer for the home, right? A little preamp mixer, where you could literally do that. Go into your apartment, and everybody has this on. Yeah, yeah. And then exactly. you could all mix and just jam, right? Right. Maybe a little five, six channel mixer. Uh, now I really want to do it. Now that you mentioned it. <laughs> so, take your take your electric guitar. You know, yes, who can, yes. who can uh, play the e-guitar in, in an apartment? Nobody. It's yes. too noisy. People in the neighborhood get, get mad and now in confinement. Yes, it's even worse. Yes. With that, you can do, you, you play your electric yeah. guitar, you, you mix it in, and you, you can even mix in uh, the sound file from, from the music uh, you want to okay. join in. No, that, that's the no. idea that I have, and I, I find that uh, some of my customers start to think about um, but yeah. I think uh, we are lacking some promotion material. Yeah. As, as yeah, yeah. Um, and, and would appreciate if you could could help that because it's well, not, not be it's not rocket science, you know. It's just no, putting no, up no, all no, the no, facts no, no. And, and 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 just all the aspects putting together. And you, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, thanks to your great presentation a lot of these today. Thanks. Thanks yeah. very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Uber, one of the things I didn't mention in this getting deep is we have a full, you know, anechoic chamber. We do services for our customers. We've done, mm -hmm. like for a case like this, which was an Alexa-enabled smoke detector. Yep. Very exciting, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we uh, you know, we did the full acoustic design for this. We have very strong ability, not in um, not electrics, but also. Um, we are, we also, our engineers uh, are, we have one of the best, our CTO is probably one of the best pro audio engineers that, you know, he yep. was, uh, you probably have heard of Mackie, right? Mm -hmm. No, Mackie bought his company for, uh, uh, to, to get into the speaker business and he was the designer of the Opal near field monitors. And so he's very, very uh, well versed exactly mm -hmm. and knowing exactly what kind of um, electronics, what product, what do you need? We've, you know, we've designed, uh, we've already designed, and we already have the amplifier channels, a USB mm -hmm. bay that we've already built our amp stage for reference. So we yeah. have all that that we can share. Um, but uh, feel free to contact me too. I would love to talk to you more about it. This is what you brought up is tr is really kind of a pet project of mine that's been sitting in the back of my head, <laughs> and I have to learn to say no to things, you know, or the my wife will kick me out of the house. <laughs> You know, uh, the market is now, you know, the market is there now, you know, yes. we have the COVID, we have people confined. There couldn't be anything more, more exciting for those, uh, those clients. And then there are hundreds yeah. of thousands. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, I know. Um, and also, you know, the, the other thing we're finding too, as you look into, the, you know, people at home that are now call centers where people for technical support are at home. Mm -hmm. Same. Or the business at home. And the interesting thing that has popped up, you know, this is our brilliant strategy, right? 
no. Is that, uh, is that you know, that the we have uh, people, uh, 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 customers that want to use this for home headsets for, for, uh, 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 for call centers, people are on all day. Yes. So now you don't have this, you can hear your child, yes. you know, you happen to have one, or your dog, which you or yeah. somebody at the door. So it's really become an interesting, it started off really, and I don't want to talk too much, but it started with Valve, and Emily Ridgeway at Valve. And if you go to Valve, um, uh, Valve Software, so, yeah. dot com, and you, or and so. Emily Ridgeway, you can see the full story. She's the one that ultimately conceived of this because they were doing um, a new game, Alex. Yeah, Alex, uh, right? Half-Life. Half-Life. And they wanted a different and more immersive VR experience to set the standard. And it was really born of that. I remember the first time she said, hey, I want to do this. We're all like, what, you crazy? You know, but, you know, she wasn't. And it was to all our benefit, you know, yeah. so one, one inspiration. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your Contact question. me over. I really, want to, I really want this one to get out in the market. And I'll appreciate right that very me. much. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it's, it's something we need to follow up. And... Uh, yeah, having having the boom microphone with it yes, really sir. going out, uh, there's a great market, I'm sure. One Thanks. more, yeah. one more thing because I can't shut up because now I am. I had <laughs> my coffee. Um, and in Seattle, we have uh, what one of my British friends say is a proper cup of coffee. He told me there wasn't any in America. We do have it here. <laughs> but, one stop. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we and we like we specialize in caffeine. Um, but uh, the other thing that's really interesting, if you look at that, there's a number of folks that had this that decided they liked watching um, uh, surround sound movies better with their headset, with, with the virtualized surround sound, mm -hmm. because that's a better experience. So, you know, it's really interesting as you move into these worlds, the kind of things that just open up. You know, to yep. me, it's yep. exciting. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. We have two more questions. Yeah. Um, so the first question is, what are the use and advantages of having BMR or ultrasonic output from a BMR? Uh, this is a really good question. Um, we're learning a lot of that ourselves, and you know, you know, you know, we've had that attribute from day one, but we never put it in our spec sheets because there was really no demand out there. Nobody cared. There's a there's a probably what we're seeing in each market space, right? Uh, the the what ultrasonic um, capability brings. Let's start with unified communications. So you go into a conference room and you have a camera and you know and you and you're looking at people coming in and out of the room. The camera can see but it can't necessarily judge distance. So you match the camera with the ultrasonics. Now you're getting a much better image of who's there and where they're sitting. So as you're starting to do beam forming, as you sit in the ultrasonics, you're able to get a much better resolution. Um, from my very bad understanding, um, but just from a few I've talked to, many some companies are using their algorithms to die, you know, around using around eight kilohertz to create a, a, a beam forming, you know, where you're saying, okay, Dave's talking, you're talking, mm -hmm. and that limits to maybe five or six people as a resolution around a table, for instance. As you move into the ultrasonics, you're able to double that resolution and maybe see up to twelve people around the table. The, you know, so you're able to uh, monitor a, a much better where people are, you know, you're a, 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 and judge distance quite a bit better um, as you match up with cameras. That's probably one of the bigger pushes that we're seeing right now. Um, the other is in, you know, with some of the bigger guys, and I think even Google does this, is using ultrasonics for machine to machine communication, right? The other is gestures and hand controls, the resolution as you come up. To let's say in the ultrasonics, your ability to be able to have much more defined hand hand gestures and controls yes. for uh, for control, where a lot of where we're seeing a trend where it's touchless devices. You know, don't hit buttons, don't do this, don't sneeze on anything. You know, and so we're seeing that. So it's around control gestures is another part. Um, I'm trying and automobiles. You know, one of the things where we find ourselves in an emerging market is near near ear or near field uh, personal audio zones. And so like putting, you know, putting the audio near people much more closer to create that. And again, you know, knowing where a person's head's moving, understanding geometries, where are your ears, are you a tall person, little person, you know, whatever it is, can help you 
um, shape how that where that audio is. Oh, sorry, we we were muted. Okay, but does that, but that that in a short does that answer your question? Um, hopefully, okay. I think so. Um, so I have another question, a little bit more technical. Uh, this question just asks how um, how does the BMR concept uh, concept like how do the TS parameters uh, how does it change the typical TS parameters of the speaker element and um, how do how does this work with passive radiators mm. uh, in a full range setup? Uh, so you can design a BMR into any system, essentially just like you would a traditional speaker. Uh, so though it does have a little bit of uh, might be have like a higher mass uh, and a little bit of lower FS, uh, you just have to adjust your uh, acoustic enclosure uh, volume accordingly um, for your simulations. Um, and otherwise, I mean, the all the components of a BMR speaker are the same um, from a manufacturing point of view as a cone speaker. Yeah. Um, it's just a different form factor for the diaphragm. Uh, so the the TS parameters that we find uh, for a BMR are very similar. Are, uh, their correlations to uh, their correlations to or the, I guess their analogies to a regular cone speaker are very similar. So for instance, if um, I show you that, there's a... Is that and so so this is one of our small demonstrators called the Gnocchi, uh, and it, so it has one BMR uh, in the top and then two passive radiators on the side. Uh, so you would design it as you would a regular um, system of, with a driver and two passive radiators, um, and then you just account for the different parameters of the speaker that you're choosing. Um, but again, we, ch we choose, or kind of the rule of thumb in design is to have your passive radiating area be about twice as large as the radiating area of your speaker. Um, yep. Perfect. Uh, so our, I think we have time for one more question, yeah. probably a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so this question is about the valve concept uh, in the psychoacoustic base algorithm. Um, so he's curious to know if there is a method to quantify the improvement of this algorithm by measurement, uh, since it's a human feeling. Uh, algorithm? Yeah, for the the psychoacoustic base. Uh, so oh, so gotcha. so the valve the valve uh, concept uh, because you're no longer like you remove the the, the heat buildup and the occlusion that typical headsets have, uh, and you actually give uh, each listener access uh, to the natural function of hearing, which is the, the head-related transfer function. So based on the shape of your head, uh, you hear the path length differences of, of uh, sounds that are coming from around all different directions. It gives you better uh, spatial perception. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you put on headphones and it covers this up, you lose access to the that um, transfer function into that kind of that mm -hmm. spatial awareness. So in the I'm not sure how much um, how, how much uh, like three D acoustic algorithm Valve is actually using, um, but I think they're they're more leveraging the fact that once you move the, the speakers off of your ears and you kind of free this all up. Uh, it gives you access to um, to that uh, spatial perception. Uh, as far as measurement goes, let's dig, why don't we dig deeper uh, in this one? I'd have to ask. Yeah, let's, um, let us, let's, yeah, let us dig a little deeper into that. That's an excellent question. Um, I think yeah. you know we should. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, do cool. we? Have, uh, was that the last question? That was the last question. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I can't tell. Nope. Uh, those were it. Um, uh, okay. Oh, oh, hello. If 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 you, if you still have a minute, this is yes, over again. Um, we have nothing to do. It's like almost eight in the morning here. We're, <laughs> we're, we're it's it's, it's quite time. quite a while ago, and I, when I worked uh, was it was a key customer was a mobile phone maker at the time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There were. Uh, solutions to generate um, 3D sound from stereo speakers yes. by a specific algorithm to drive those speakers. Mm -hmm. um, now, my question is with the off-ear, 
uh, and and the valve, for example, the VR valve or or any any kind of. Uh, is there also a way with a BMR to do that to to uh, induce kind of um, this, this 3D effect by a specific algorithm? Absolutely. In fact, Dolby uses our speakers for their demos. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay. So you know, that's really interesting because you would think even with Dolby, it'd be counterintuitive to think a wide directed, right? Wide directivity speaker would be able to bounce off, you know, off the ceiling. And they were actually using a bunch of these we had that we were kind of into life. We said, yeah, they took almost all of them. So this is literally the last one. Um, um, so we have one, but the, but er, but you know I'm just going to jump in here real. Yeah, sure. But when you look at the pistonic behavior and that initial impulse of the wave mm -hmm. function, it has that it has the, enough of the uh, energy in that initial pulse, and as it rolls out, that you do get the reflections, and you do, um, you know, so uh, you you. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, 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 oh, um, so yeah, it, I believe I believe it is the case with BMR uh, that in that first that first impulse, yep. uh, all of the information arrives, uh, yep. all the spatial information arrives uh, before the beginning of the precedent effect, which is where you as a person would perceive two sounds being different yep. versus two sounds being the same. Yeah, well, so better technically said, but the the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we love to talk a lot over here with. So, 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 uh, say the know-how how to do that is, is is within the hands of a couple of companies around the world, I guess. So, uh, it would would need to be partnering up. I guess there are some some IPs uh, on on how to do that. So, if there is a customer who tries to to do that with the BMRs of ear, we may need to come back to you and <laughs> ask if you have some ideas out there to work with absolutely you know what we're always one of the things we look we do is science projects proof of concepts we mm -hmm. think it's really important to put that in the hand and you know kind of bring up a good question we have a very strong engineering crew design r d we're constantly we're trying to learn more we don't know everything and um, so if you do find this is interesting and you have you know have a partner we're more than happy to jump in with a, to, to do a proof of concept with you you know it's and, and and to, so you can, we do this very often. In fact, one of our methodologies is, you know, once, especially as we're moving and dealing with many companies that never really have dealt with audio before is to, to, to design representative acoustic subsystems, prove it out and say, hey, at the end of the day, this is the audio you're gonna get. Is that, is that what you want? Yeah, it is, then we move on. So if you, you know, I invite you to reach out to us. I, you know, I'm commit right now, we'll help you. Um, Paul will, yeah. Well, I, Paul will be the man for you, and we'll just see what okay. works. We're happy to do it. Yeah. Just, I, I don't have a project and a customer yet, but uh, it's something that I'm interested in in the principle. So if I talk to customers that I can understand, is, is it possible or not? I mean, just, just uh, yes. Then, yes. then if I find somebody who's really keen on doing that, uh, and, and, and now knowing that it's possible, uh, of course, we we'll come back then to you. Okay. okay. That's, that's a good thing. Thank you for considering us. Perfect. Should, should uh, be great, great for gaming, definitely, and uh, yeah. even for yes, for yes. watching movies and whatever you know. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's it's time, I think. Yeah. You know, unless uh, there's anybody else, we can unless, in. unless there's plenty more last minute questions. And, um, and and if not, you know, Julio, just go get him. You, know, yeah. <laughs> you can always connect us, so we'll happy to help you any way we can. Yeah, I believe they, they have our information up on the mm -hmm. uh, email somewhere. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, uh, again, a pleasure. Reach out if you have any questions. Uh, yeah. if it's a, we did it. We did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.